Hello, and welcome to lecture number five, chapter 23, Broad Patterns of Evolution, for John Tyler Community College, uh, General Biology 2. My name is Mr. Sparks, and I will be your lecturer for this PowerPoint. <clears throat> Past organisms were very different from those now alive today. We can easily see this based on the fossil record. The fossil record shows evidence of macroevolution, broad changes above the species level. For example, the emergence of terrestrial vertebrates from uh, fish and amphibians, the impact of mass extinctions such as the great demise of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago, and the origin of flight in birds uh, some 90 to 100 million years ago. All of these great changes are uh, considered to be macroevolution. That's to distinguish it from microevolution, which was the last lecture, which talked about changes in uh, species or in populations. Okay, here is uh, an example of uh, uh, dinosaurs uh, living in their, uh, this is an imaginary uh, reconstruction of their habitat in Antarctica. Believe it or not, Antarctica, which is today barren and covered with ice, at one point in um, paleo history, it was uh, uh, heavily forested and a much warmer climate. A climate suitable to reptiles like these dinosaurs, Cryolophosaurus. Uh, they're a relative, distant relative of a Tyrannosaurus rex. Um, the fossils uh, in this area around Antarctica reveal that the uh, ocean around Antarctica was warm and teeming with tropical inv invertebrates. So uh, we're going to look at some of the mechanisms about how different continents could have different ecological conditions uh, throughout time. Here's the skull of the Cryolophosaurus, um, just to show you uh, that is, uh, in fact, a dinosaur living in Antarctica. The fossil record documents life's history. The fossil record reveals changes in the history of life on Earth. Um, here's an example of, the, of a very simplified fossil record. Let's start at the bottom here. At the bottom we see uh, a fossil stromatolite. These are um, bacterial colonies which accrue uh, calcium carbonate and that calcium carbonate builds up into shells over layers upon layers and this leaves fossil remnants of, uh, of those organisms. Stromatolites live even today. There's a few places around the world, uh, particularly in the uh, southern uh, and Pacific region. Uh, there's one area that's very famous called Hamlin Bay in Australia. In Hamlin Bay, they have living stromatolites. They grow in this, uh, this bay that's cut off from the rest of the ocean, and uh, the water conditions are have lower oxygenation, which is beneficial to these um, bacteria. And the stromatolites are cyanobacteria. They uh, are photosynthetic and they, they produce oxygen as a byproduct. Tapania here is believed to be one of the first um, uh, eukaryotic organisms. Um, very primitive, about one and a half billion years old. Uh, so there was um, two billion years between the original prokaryotes organisms, two billion years until the eukaryotes arise. Um, later on in time, 560 million years ago, um, multicellular organisms begin to make an appearance in the fossil record. Um, 510 million years ago, Hallucigenia, which is an organism found in the Burgess Shale in Canada. It's a um, complicated uh, multi-part uh, organism, and uh, it's it baffled uh, paleontologists for a long period of time. They didn't know whether it was an organism or whether it was uh, 
a collection of different parts that had fallen together. But since they've discovered the first one, they've discovered others that have similar form. Uh, Cococcio cuspidatus is a fish, a placoderm, a fish-like vertebrate um, that occurred uh, around the Devonian period of time. Uh, it had a bony shield sh that, that uh, protected its front end here. Uh, Tiktaalik, about 375 million years ago, is a primitive ancestor of all tetrapods. Um, this is when these fish started to develop their limbs and they, be, they, they began to live in the shallow water areas. Um, Tiktaalik is, uh, it's, like an, it's like a fish, almost a fish and an amphibian together. It had uh, robust limbs that it used to crawl around in the shallow waters and it most probably gave rise to the tetrapod, tetrapods. Tetrapods are all four-limbed uh, vertebrates, so everything um, you know from uh, from frogs to humans. Okay, about 270 million years ago in the age of dinosaurs uh, there was an animal known as Dimetrodon. Dimetrodon was actually uh, a, a cynodont. It was more closely related to uh, mammals than it was related to reptiles. Uh, it, was, it was another step on the lineage towards mammalian species. Um, okay, Romulosaurus victor. This is a plesiosaur. It's a, it's a, an, a, a marine reptile that swam around and you know some people believe that uh, it's that um, Loch Ness Monster is a plesiosaur, but don't believe in the Loch Ness Monster. It's never been proven. There's no evidence that it ex ever existed. But that's what people believe, is that it, it would be a landlocked plesiosaur. Here's the stromatolite cross-section. It shows layer upon layer as uh, the uh, bacteria grow each year. They accrue more and more uh, calcium carbonate. Here's the stromatolites of Hamlin Pool in Australia. Living organisms, they look like rocks. Here's Tapania, the, uh, one of the first eukaryotes. Dixonia castata, one of the first uh, multicellular organisms. Hallucinogenia, a multicellular organism that's uh, baffled paleontologists. Uh, Cocosteus, the uh, placoderm, the uh, vertebrate fish-like uh, animal with uh, bony plates around its head and thorax. Tiktaalik, the, um, the uh, progenitor of all tetrapods, the ancestor of four-limbed or uh, terrestrial and uh, organisms. Dimetrodon, the dinosaur that is more closely related to mammals than to reptiles. And Romulosaurus, the plesiosaur. Sedimentary rocks are deposited into layers called strata. And our richest are now the richest source of fossils. Okay, in an earlier lecture we talked about how sedimentary rocks are laid down in uh, lake beds and river beds and on the marine uh, coastal plains. The fossil record indicates that there have been great changes in the kinds of organisms on Earth at different points in time. So at one point in time there was the Dimetrodon and the Plesiosaur. Um, but now we no longer have these organisms, so it thereby indicates that there have been changes in the kinds of organisms over a period of time. Few individuals have fossilized and even fewer have been discovered. Okay, the fossil record is incomplete. It, um, the fossil record, it, uh, for, in order for a, fossil, a species to become fossilized in the fossil record, it has to have existed for a long period of time. It has to be, um, have been abundant and widespread. And it has to have 
hard parts. And also, it has to have lived in an area that had sedimentary deposition. So a marine environment, uh, there are many marine fossils because of uh, sedimentary deposition on the coastal plains and the and uh, there are you know there are uh, fossil depositions in uh, where where there used to be um, um, well look at the Grand Canyon is a good example that was once the bottom of a shallow sea and that deposition over time the layers I don't know how many of you have ever been out west but out west they have uh, these deposition sedimentary deposition rock uh, which is, it's very uh, easy to understand the nature of uh, sedimentary deposition. And so what I'm getting at here is that in, for fossils to occur, they ha that animal has to have lived and then died and then found its way, you know, its remains have to find its way into a sedimentary deposition. Sedimentary strata reveal the relative ages of fossils. The absolute ages of fossils can be determined by radiometric dating. <clears throat> uh, there's uh, radiocarbon dating, and there's uh, other radioisotopic data um, or dating that can be uh, that can occur with different isotopes. Uh, a parent isotope decays to a daughter isotope at a constant rate. Each isotope is known has a known half life the time required for the parent isotope to decay. Okay, so here's an example of all radioisotopes. Um, you know the specific half-life for uh, carbon-14, and uh, that de decays into carbon-12, and then uh, the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 is what tells you the, uh, the age of the... Or of the uh, fossil. So basically in this example that the, the time of deposition or the time of depth uh, or time of death in, uh, in um, archaeology we can use uh, we can use the time of death as the time that the organism last um, inputted carbon 14 into its skeletal structure and then that carbon 14 begins to decay over time um, <clears throat> Uh, when there's half of that rem rem remaining, that's a uh, one time level, that's, uh, you know, this is actually uh, not a great example, but, um, okay, let me, uh, okay, so carbon-14 decays relatively quickly. Its half-life is 5,730 years. So, if you decay its half-life to... Uh, it to if there there's half of the original carbon 14 that is in found in the environment then that organism is uh, 2500 and some odd years old okay so uh, the the ratio between the parent isotope and the daughter isotope gives you the time this could be for carbon 14 or uranium 238 decays very slowly it's half half life is four and a half billion years. So, um, if if this is the original amount of uranium, then the half life here would be um, two point uh, two five billion years. Radiocarbon dating can be used to date fossils up to seventy five thousand years old. For older fossils, some isotopes can be used to date the volcanic rock layers above and below the fossil. The geologic record has a standard time scale, dividing Earth's history into Hadean, Archaean, Proterozoic, and Phanerozoic eons. The Phanerozoic encompasses most of the time that animals have lived on Earth. Phanerozoic is divided into three eras, the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. Major boundaries between geological divisions correspond to extinction events in the fossil record. Okay, here is the um, geologic record. There's the major eons 
uh, are on on the far left here. We're going to get into more detail in some future slides, but there's the Phanerozoic, Proterozoic, Archaean, and Hadean. And what I want you guys to know most about is the Phanerozoic. Okay, the Phanerozoic includes the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. And these are eras um, extending from uh, half a billion years ago, 542 million years ago, um, during the Paleozoic. You need to know the eras, the Cenozoic, Mesozoic, and Paleozoic. So the Cenozoic is the most recent time period. That includes the time of... Uh, of mammals and humans in the in the later Quaternary period, uh, the Mesozoic period is the time of uh, the dinosaurs in the later part of the Mesozoic. The Cretaceous is when flowering plants evolved. Um, the Paleozoic is uh, the uh, time um, when uh, primitive organisms evolved in the, during the Cambrian and Ordovician period and more advanced uh, tetrapods. The, uh, the Tiktaalik existed in the Devonian period and uh, gave rise to uh, terrestrial uh, vertebrates like uh, lizards and reptiles and what have you. Okay, so here is the um, Paleozoic period in more detail. You don't need to know this detail, but you do need to know that it's the Paleozoic period and what organisms occur in there. Uh, there's the Cambrian period where there was a sudden increase in diversity of many animal phyla. Here's Hallucinogenia right here. Uh, the Ordovician, the marine algae is abundant. Colonization of land by diverse fungi, plants, and animals. The Silurian, which is the diverse, diversification of early vascular plants. Um, <clears throat> uh, Devonian, the diversification of fishes and the first tetrapods like Tiktaalik begin to appear. Uh, Carboniferous is a time of uh, vascular plants form, the first seed plants. This is during the... Um, and also the um, non-vascular ferns, uh, tree ferns that existed. This is the this is the area when this is the time when um, uh, these plants caused the deposition of coal. So the Carboniferous is uh, very important to us today because it was the origin of the coal swamps. The Permian period is the radiation of reptiles and most of the present day groups of insects. Okay, the, the uh, Mesozoic period is the era of the dinosaurs, the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. Um, Cone-bearing plants, the gymnosperms dominate the landscape. Dinosaurs evolve and radiate, and the origin of mammals. Okay, so mammals originate down here in the Triassic, but they do not radiate into modern species until after the death of the dinosaurs. Okay, that's because the death of the dinosaurs, the extinction of the dinosaurs allowed for um, the uh, mammal populations to fill those ecological niches. Okay, flowering plants originate in the Cretaceous, but they really began to uh, um, evolve in the, um, they began to radiate in the um, Paleogene period, in the uh, early part of the Cenozoic. So in the Cenozoic, there's the Paleogene, Paleocene, Eocene, Oligocene. This is what great uh, radiation of the mammals, the different diversification and evolution of the mammals. Um, the Miocene, uh, continued radiation of mammals. Uh, the Pliocene uh, is the, uh, the appearance of bipedal human ancestors. And... Uh, the Quaternary is the Holoc it includes the Pleistocene and the Holocene. Those are the most recent eras um, where the genus Homo and um, we begin to uh, have an effect on area on, on uh, environment. It's uh, there's a new era being proposed known as the Anthropocene. That's the uh, era there where the humans have the dominant influence on the environment. The oldest known structures are stromatolites, rocks formed by accumulation of 
sedimentary layers on bacterial mats. Stromatolites date back 35 billion years ago. Prokaryotes were Earth's sole inhabitants for more than one and a half billion years. Early prokaryotes released oxygen into the atmosphere through a process of photosynthesis. The increase in atmospheric ox oxygen that began 2.4 billion years ago led to the extinction of many primitive organisms, many, especially prokaryotes. Uh, the eukaryotes flourished in the oxygen rich atmosphere and gave rise to multicellular organisms. The origin of new groups of organisms. Mammals began to belong to the group of animals called tetrapods. The evolution of unique mammal, mammalian features can be traced through gradual changes over time. Okay, here we show uh, some of the um, uh, the lineage of mammals from, uh, remember we, we talked about Dimetrodon uh, through the therapsids into the cyanodonts. Um, basically what I want you to look at here is here are different um, parts of the skull bones and they adapt uh, to different conditions throughout time. Uh, primitive synapsid has this area called the temporal fin fenestrae this is an area where uh, muscles came through and helped to close the jaw bones and make it an effective predator. The therapsid also has the tem temporal uh, fenestrae. Um, uh, it has a hinge in its jaw. The early cyanodonts have the temporal fenestrae. The later cyanodonts begin to lose the temporal fenestrae. And what's also interesting here, I want you to look at the articular and quadrate bones here and here. Um, these bones were later adapted to form the, the ear bones of, the, um, of mammals. And ears are, are an adaptation in mammals that are particularly well developed. The sense of hearing in mammals is, is one of the uh, advantages that mammals have over reptiles. Reptiles do have a sense of hearing, but it's not as highly evolved as mammals are. Okay, here's the uh, phylogeny uh, showing the, how Dimetrodon is related to the uh, therapsids and cyanodonts. The very late uh, non-mammalian cyanodonts over here, they became extinct. Dimetrodon became extinct. Um, the mammals survived. Synapsid had single pointed teeth, large temporal fenestrae, and a jaw hinge between the articular and quadrate bone. Therapsids had large dentary bones, long faces, and specialized teeth, including large canines. Okay, so here's the synapsids and the therapsids. Early synodonts had large dentary bones and lower jaw, large temporal fenestrae in front of the jaw, and teeth with several cusps. Later synodonts had teeth with complex cusp patterns and additional jaw, pa jaw hinge between the dentary and squamosal bones. Very late synodonts lost the original articular quadrate jaw hinge the articular quadrate bones formed the inner ear bones that functioned in transmitting sound. In mammals, these bones became the hammer, the malleus, and the anvil, the incus. Bones, these are the bones of the ear. Okay, so here's the, you can't see these um, uh, articular and quadrate bones in the cyanodont here. They, they're tucked up inside the bone. And this is like, Again, this is not calling. Call, uh, this is you know evolution. So this is occurring over uh, species and genus and families and orders uh, over time, long periods of time. Um, these are interpretations that we're making from the evolutionary record. The rise and fall of groups of organisms reflect differences in speciation and extinction rates. The history of life on Earth has seen the rise and fall of many groups of organisms. The rise and fall of groups depend on speciation and extinction rates within the group.
Okay, so here's an example. Here's a phylogeny, lineage A and lineage B. Uh, lineage A has uh, numerous extinction events before the present event. Only one uh, species of that lineage is surviving to today. And lineage B shows uh, a greater success rate. Okay, this is a more adapted to environmental conditions. Only one species went extinct, and all these other species uh, adapted and survived. These are present day conditions, so in the future, it's possible that conditions could change and all of these lineages could go extinct, or all but one of them could go extinct, and then this one lineage that survives in lineage A, it could radiate out into um, numerous other lineages. This could be the successful lineage, and this could be the unsuccessful lineage. It all depends on environmental circumstances and evolutionary change. At three points in time, the land masses of Earth have formed a supercontinent. 1.1 billion years ago, 600 million years ago, and most recently, 250 million years ago. The formation, that was the formation of the supercontinent Pangaea. According to the theory of plate tectonics, Earth's crust is composed of plates floating on the Earth's mantle. So, what's happening is like, uh, these, uh, the, 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 uh, the continents are like, um, kind of bits of foam that float on the top of the, uh, on, on the surface of the seawater as it crashes, the waves crash into it, and they float around like foam on top of water. Inside the deepest core of the earth, the inner core, is an iron nickel core, and it's just, uh, it's blazing hot. There's, the, the more, uh, the deeper you get into the earth's core, the higher the pressures you get. The, there's, uh, Incre uh, there's intense, intense, and unbelievable pressure on the inside of the Earth's core. Then there's the outer core, which is a little bit cooler, and the mantle. The mantle is um, the area where um, this is um, typically uh, molten lava, like where you see um, molten lava when a volcano erupts, like pictures of the Hawaiian volcanoes. I've got a couple of those videos in the... Um, video selection for you, um, the, and, um, so on top of that, uh, on top of that molten lava is the crust of the earth. The crust of the earth is where, um, the, these continents float around, and in geologic time, they're just kind of bouncing around, but in, uh, in real time, in human time, the, this, these changes are occurring over hundreds of thousands and millions of years. And the, um, the, the, the tectonic plates move slowly through a process of continental drift. Oceanic and continental plates can separate, slide past each other, or collide. Interactions between plates cause the formation of mountains and islands and earthquakes. So when these, uh, when uh, <clears throat> there are there are different ways that uh, these things can occur. So a mountain forms when uh, two continental plates bump up against one another, and one continental plate uh, goes um, is driven underneath the other continental plate, and that ra that raises up the the first continental plate, and that the rubbing against the, the continental plates of the um, <clears throat> against each other is what causes earthquakes. So that's uh, when we experienced an earthquake uh, about six years ago um, in Virginia. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers that earthquake that we had, but that is what that is, is the continental plates rubbing up against each other, one pushing underneath the other one. And they're, they're vibrating like um, if you rubbed, uh, um, you know, two pieces of, uh, rubber together, they might uh, vibrate. Okay, that's a really bad example, but okay, and then the way that islands are formed is that there are hot spots in the crust of the earth, and those hot spots are areas where the, the <clears throat> volcanic um, eruptions can occur, um, and, they, and they bubble up through that area, and that, that molten lava becomes rock, and that rock becomes the basis of uh, 
of islands. Now that it's in the case of the Hawaiian Islands, that uh, area is stationary, and uh, <clears throat> the um, crust moves over top of the the uh, hole, and the hole allows those um, islands to be formed, and they I, they form over time. One island forms, and then another island forms behind it, and then another island forms behind it, and that is how uh, you get an archipelago, which is a chain of islands. Okay, here are the major crustal plates. Uh, you don't have to know this, but this is just for your own personal information. Uh, there's the North American plate, the Caribbean plate. Um, okay, these are when these plates, uh, these plates here show that they're uh, separating, and then uh, other plates show where they're uh, they're bumping up together. So these plates are African plate is moving this way towards the Indian plate, and the Indian plate is moving north, and it's causing the Himalayan mountains to be created. So the Himalayan mountains are very young mountains, and the Appalachian mountains are very old mountains. And one way you can tell that is the Appalachian mountains are very, um, uh, they're, they're highly eroded, and they have soft, rounded shapes, whereas the Himalayan mountains are very sharp and pointy, for lack of a better word. The formation of the supercontinent Pangaea was about 250 million years ago, and it had many effects. The, it caused the deepening of ocean basins, a reduction in shallow water habitat, and a colder, drier climate inland. Okay, here's Pangaea 250 million years ago. This is uh, just during the end of the Paleozoic period, okay, which... Um, as you recall, we already had uh, multicellular organisms, uh, uh, we had primitive arthropods, then we had uh, fish, the evolution of different fish, tiktaalik and the tetrapods, the, car the carboniferous age, um, the uh, early reptiles, all of this happened during the supercontinent Pangaea phase. Okay, the Mesozoic pa phase, which was the time of the dinosaurs, um, you, you had a little bit uh, more, the, the continents were starting to split apart. Um, in 65 million years ago, this is the end of the age of the dinosaurs, the beginning of the age of mammals. Um, you have, uh, you still have uh, these uh, continents are still pretty close together. Okay, well, uh, what we're gonna we're gonna talk about this a little bit in the future about how like the we can tell like similarity of fossils between these different continental areas should indicate that they were closer together. But it's also true that even modern day species like the lungfish, the lungfish occurs in southern Africa and it also occurs in uh, South America, and uh, we speculate that that's because uh, that that's called biogeography. And or zoogeography, and that reason for that is that the um, that uh, during this primitive time, during the Mesozoic period, these uh, continents were close together. Okay, and then here's the present day um, a, a habitat. Basically, um, all right, uh, where uh, India is colliding with uh, Eurasia. That's the major tectonic event of our day. Okay, Pangaea, Gondwana, present-day continents. Okay, so here I want you to see that um, about 65 million years ago, before that time, uh, Australia was already uh, set off on its own. Now, it, this is one reason why Australia has distinct fauna. It has a primarily marsupial-dominated fauna, uh, where the rest of the world has um, placental uh, fauna. And that's because Australia split off so early on. And it was uh, isolated from the rest of the continents. Continental drift can cause a continent's climate to change as it moves north or south. Separation of land masses can lead to an allopatric speciation. 
For example, the frog species in the subfamilies Mantellinae and Racophorinae began to diverge when Madagascar separated from India. Okay, so here's, uh, here's Madagascar and India very close together 88 million years ago. In a relatively short period of time, the, the, uh, India, the India plate, subcontinental plate movement was a very rapid in occurrence, and it, and, and it basically crashed into Asia, and that force of that crash caused the Himalayan mountains. But I digress. Back to the frogs. Okay, so here we have, uh, it shows that uh, in Madagascar, um, we had uh, uh, different, uh, the, the same, same lineage of frogs, but they managed to uh, diversify to be quite distinct. Okay, when present-day Madagascar began to separate from India, the frog subfamilies Mantelli and Racophrinidae started to diverge, ultimately forming hundreds of new species in each location. The maps show the movement of De Madagascar and India over time. The distribution of fossils and living groups reflects the historic movement of continents. For example, the similarity of fossils the similarity of fossils in parts of South America and Africa is consistent with the idea that these continents were formally attached. Even as I mentioned before, the, the lungfish occurs, there are lungfish that occur in South America and lungfish that occur in Africa. So even, uh, you know, living fossils, if you will, animals that are very primitive also share the same biogeography. Mass extinctions. The fossil record shows that most species that have ever lived are now extinct. Extinction can be caused by changes to a species environment. At times, the rate of extinction has increased dramatically and caused a mass extinction. Mass extinction is the result of disruptive environmental changes. Okay. In each of the five mass extinction events, there have been five mass extinction events to date, more than 50% of the Earth's species became extinct. Okay, here are the five mass extinction events. The five generally recognized mass extinction events in indicated by the red arrows represent peaks in the extinction rate of marine animal families. Okay, because of course marine animals are more likely to be fossilized. These mass extinctions interrupted the overall increase in the number of marine animal families over time. Okay, so they caused changes in the, in the, in the types of uh, animals that were able to survive. Okay, here's the, the main extinctions that we are concerned with is the, the uh, Cretaceous tertiary boundary uh, which is uh, this extinction here. You can see it's a pretty big extinction, but it's not, it's not as great an extinction as these uh, past extinction rates. Now, the thing about extinction rates is you have to remember that we're looking at the fossil record, and we only, we're only looking at samples of fossils that are the type that are likely to be fossilized. But these uh, conditions generally suggest that these are the major fossilized, major uh, extinction events. The Permian extinction defines the boundary between Paleozoic and Mesozoic eras 250 million years ago. This mass extinction occurred in less than 500,000 years and caused the extinction of about 96% of marine animal species. A number of factors might have contributed to these extinctions. Okay, ex intense volcanism, volcanic activity in what we now uh, know as Siberia, uh, global warming resulting from the emission of large amounts of CO2s from the volcanoes, reduced temperature gradient from equator to poles, and ocean anoxia or lack of oxygen from mi reduced mixing of ocean waters. The, all these conditions are, uh, could be affecting these marine 
in environments. The Cretaceous mass extinction from 65 million years ago separates the Mesozoic from the Cenozoic. Organisms that went extinct include about half of all marine species and many terrestrial plants and animals, including most dinosaurs. The presence of iridium in sedimentary rocks suggests that a meteorite is about 60, impact about 65 million years ago. Okay, iridium is an element that is relatively rare here on Earth, but it's more common in meteorites. When the me meteorite struck the Earth, it blew up a cloud of, uh, of dust, which included iridium from the meteorite, which blanketed the Earth and probably uh, cut out uh, sunlight and otherwise made life in, in uh, Earth inhospitable for life. And then uh, that layer of iridium settled down into the sedimentary rocks and uh, cre created what we know now as the Cretaceous-Tertiary boundary, or the iridium layer. Dust clouds caused by the impact would have blocked sunlight and disturbed global climate. The Chicxulub crater off the coast of Mexico is evidence of a meteorite, uh, a large meteorite collision that dates to about the same time. Okay, so we pretty much got it figured out. Like here was a massive meteorite that came in, and um, it struck the uh, it struck uh, North America. This is a you know this this is you have to keep in mind this is 65 million years ago, so it didn't look exactly like this. But the Chicxulub crater is a is a marine crater crater that exists under the water in the Yucatan Peninsula, and it's uh, it indicates a massive collision by a meteorite. Scientists estimate that the current rate of extinction is 100 to 1,000 times the typical background rate. So, are we living in a six mass extinction? The extinction rates tend to increase when global temperatures increase. Data suggests that, six, that the sixth human-caused mass extinction is likely to occur unless dramatic action is taken. And this dramatic action falls under the category of conservation biology, which is a topic that we're going to discuss at the end of the semester. Okay, uh, here are some extinction events, relative extinction event. Uh, over relative uh, temperature over time. Um, I don't think this is a very helpful graph, but it does suggest that uh, when climate is warmer, there are increased uh, extinction events. Now, why that may, that may be due to uh, other factors, um, you know, like such as the uh, Cretaceous Tertiary Chicxulub Crater meteorite may cause the warming by result of uh, kicking up a lot of dust in the atmosphere. The consequences of mass extinctions. Mass extinctions can alter ecological communities and the niches available to organisms. It can take five to a hundred million years for diversity to recover following a mass extinction. The type of organisms residing in a community can change with mass extinction. For example, the percentage of marine predators increased after the Permian and Cretaceous mass extinctions. Mass extinction can pave the way for adaptive radiations. So, after a mass extinction occurs, the organisms that do survive have the ability to adapt into those ecological niches that are vacated by the extinct species. Okay, so here's the uh, massive Permian in, uh, uh, mass extinction, and this shows uh, the Permian and Cretaceous mass extinctions indicated by red areas, red arrows, altered the ecology of the oceans by increasing the percentage of marine genera that were predators. So you have more predators, um, more the per, more predators following these mass extinctions. And that, of course, indicates that there must be more prey, a larger prey base. So that in increased the, um, the opportunities for evolution over time. 
Adaptive radiation is the evolution of many diversely adapted species from a common ancestor. Remember the Galapagos finch? There was the one Galapagos finch that found its way to the island and then to the island changed the archipelago and then it evolved in, into different ecological niches. That's and different species. That is, that is uh, adaptive radiation. Adaptive radiations may follow mass extinctions or the evolution of a novel characteristic or the colonizations, colonizations of new species. Like angiosperms uh, evolved a novel characteristic, the flowering plant. Um, the flowering plant was uh, very successful and uh, as new uh, insect species evolved to adapt to the flowering plant, uh, that process of co-evolution allowed for adaptive radiation of the angiosperms. The, and the colonization of new regions, like uh, when an animal, uh, when, a, when a group of, or a species can inhabit a new uh, island or uh, another area that has no uh, competitors in it or no predators, it can easily uh, adapt to those new, can, those new vacant ecological niches. Mammals underwent an adaptive radiation after the extinction of terrestrial dinosaurs. The disappearance of dinosaurs, except birds, allowed for the expansion of mammals in diversity and size. Other notable radiations include photosynthetic prokaryotes, large predators in the Cam Cambrian, and land, plants, insects, and tetrapods. Okay, so... <clears throat> Alright, during the... Um, when the uh, photosynthetic bacteria began to um, produce uh, oxygen and that cleared the environment um, for uh, eukaryotic species... Okay, so all these, uh, all these are all different adaptations, uh, examples of, of radiations. Photosynthetic prokaryotes, large predators in the Cambrian, land plants, insects, and tetrapods, and, you know, of course, mammals. Okay, so here are the ancestral Sanodont uh, and the ancestral mammal about uh, two, 175 million years ago. Okay, monotremes uh, were the first to evolve. Um, monotremes include the platypus and the echidna. And I don't know, if, does, does anybody know what the uh, characteristic of the monotreme is that makes it distinct from other mammals? They're able to lay eggs. Monotremes lay eggs as part of their reproduction, um, which makes them distinct from the marsupials and the eutherians. Okay, marsupials... Um, uh, give birth to premature young, and the, those young then in, inhabit a pouch. Um, those are uh, marsupials, and they're uh, they are mostly found in the, on the continent of Australia. Because remember how Australia how well, Australia was separated from the other continents very on, early on. Um, monotremes also occur in Australia. The eutherians are the uh, placental mammals, and that's basically everything else that we know of. Um, they uh, inhabit the, the rest of the known world. Adaptive radiations can occur when organisms colonize new environments with little competition. The Hawaiian Islands are one of the greatest showcases of adaptive radiation. Okay. Here are uh, many different species of plants that are, are all in the same ge genus, except for uh, Agixo, the, the silver sword. This is the silver sword plant here. Um, here are the um, uh, Dobachia, different uh, species of Dobachia. Look at their different forms they are, have here. Um, they're, they're, they're quite distinct, and they've all, they're all associated with different islands. So... Um, the Bachia uh, Wailei Lei is uh, affiliated with Kauai Island, one of the most furthest out islands. And then uh, the Bachia Laksa is affiliated with Molokai. And um, the Bachia Scabra is more common in the other islands. And the Bachia Linarius is, a, is uh, affiliated with the big island of Hawaii. 
Now, um, the silver sword is one of the most endangered species on the planet, and they, it was uh, under attack by uh, people brought in goats into the area, and the goats kept on feeding on the on the silver sword. And so it was uh, one of the conservation movements was to kill off the goats of the silver sword. But anyway, all of these um, debaccia are closely related to, to the carquistia, the North the uh, North American tarweed, and then they all evolved on these different uh, island ecosystems to have uh, different characteristics. That's adaptive radiation. Okay, the Hawaiian Islands is one of the most uh, isolated places. It's the most isolated uh, archipelago on the face of the earth. There's, it's, it's further from any, any other continental landmass than any other islands. Major changes in body form can result from changes in the sequences and regulation of developmental genes. Studying genetic mechanisms of change can provide insight into large-scale evolutionary change. Okay, so um, we all know how natural selection works, but this is gonna. This section is gonna describe one of the mechanisms of natural selection, and that is the the. Um, developmental genes. Genes that program development influence the rate, timing, and spatial separation and spatial pattern of cha changes in an organism's form as it develops into an adult. Heterochrony is the evolutionary change in the rate of timing of developmental events. It can have significant impact on body shape, and the contrasting shapes of human and chimpanzee skulls are the result of small changes in relative growth rates. So we're talking about changes in these genes, not necessarily changes in the, in the, um, uh, the DNA. So changes in developmental genes can have great evolutionary impact. So here we look at the... <clears throat> The, in the human evolutionary lineage, mutations showed the, slowed the growth of the jaw relative to the other parts of the skull. As a result, the humans, in humans, the skull of an adult is more similar to the skull of an infant than is the case for chimpanzees. So, um, what this did was there was a, a set of genes that allows for the development of the of the skull in the gene in the humans and the chimpanzees, two closely related species. In the chimpanzee, it's actually the there's more changes, so it indicates that there's a greater change in the adult form. In the human adult, the human uh, uh, skull is more is is more similar to the uh, the human fetus. So the um, <clears throat> The human fo uh, form, this actually allowed for a larger brain capacity, and that larger brain capacity is what gives us some of our advantage as human beings. Another example of heterochrony can be seen in the skeletal structure of bat wings, which resulted from an increase in the growth rate of finger bones. Heterochrony is responsible for the increased total length of hand and finger bones in a bat compared to that of other animals. Can you locate the bat's wrist and elbow joints? Calculate the ratio of the length of the bat's longest set of one hand to the finger bones and the length of its radius. Compare this ratio to the ratio of bones in your own hand and arm. So, these are developmental genes that are causing differences in uh, uh, evolved mammals. Heterochrony can alter the timing of reproductive development 
relative to the de development of non-reproductive organs. In pedomorphosis, uh, the, the rate of reproductive development accelerates compared with somatic development. The sexually mature species may retain a body feature that were juvenile structures in an ancestral species. Okay, here's the axotl. It's a uh, salamander from Central America, and it, this is an adult salamander. Now, normally, gills are a characteristic of a juvenile salamander, but in this species, uh, it's completely aquatic, and the gills are uh, a characteristic of the adult cat. cat the adult salamander. The adults of some species retain their features that were juvenile in ancestors. This salamander is an axotl, an aquatic species that grows to full size, becomes sexually mature, and reproduces all while retaining the larval char characteristics, including gills. Changes in spatial pattern. Substantial evolutionary change can also result from alterations in genes that control the placement and organization of body parts. Homeotic genes de determine such basic features as where wings and legs will develop on a bird or how a flower's parts are arranged. <clears throat> Hox genes are a class of homeotic genes that, that provide positional information during animal development. If Hox genes are expressed in the wrong location, body parts can be produced in the wrong location. So, for example, we can see crustaceans, uh, a, a swimming appendage can be produced instead of a feeding appendage. So these Hox genes are really important in the development of different organisms. If they're, if they're altered or expressed incorrectly, uh, they can cause uh, damaging mutations to the to the organism. Of course, those adaptations, those those uh, mutations could be adaptations, and in, in which case um, they would uh, they they might contribute to the evolutionary success of the organism, providing that those uh, those mutations uh, affect uh, germ cells. An adaptive the evolution of development. Adaptive evolution of both new and existing genes may have played a key role in shaping the diversity of life. Developmental genes may have been particularly important in this process. New morphological forms likely come from gene duplication events that produce new developmental genes. A possible mechanism for the evolution of six-legged insects from many-legged crustacean ancestor has been demonstrated in lab experiments. Specific changes in the UBX gene have been identified as the that can turn off leg development. Okay, so here's a particular gene on a, um, a developmental gene, a Hox gene, and um, this uh, indicates the differences between uh, Drosophila, the fruit fly, and Artemida, which is the um, brine shrimp or the sea monkey. You may be familiar with sea monkeys, or probably not, it's probably something before your time. But here this indicates um, that uh, the same gene controls uh, on, on the, if you look at the genetics of these two different species uh, and you identify the gene by marking it with uh, genetic markers, radionucleotides, uh, you can determine that the, that the gene is active for uh, the production of legs in both species is the same gene. Changes in morphology likely result from changes in the regulation of developmental genes rather than changes in the sequence of developmental genes. <clears throat> okay, let me say that again. Changes in morphology likely result from changes in the regulation of developmental genes rather than the changes in the sequence of developmental genes. For example, the three spined sticklebacks in lakes have fewer spines than their marine relatives. The, the gene sequence remains the same, but the regulation of the gene expression is different in the two groups of fish. 
Okay, here's the three spine stickleback. It's got its little spines sticking out there in the ventral surface, ventral spines. Um, the, the, that, this is the oceanic version, the marine version, and the uh, lake version lacks those. Okay, so the fir the, there are two hypotheses that they tested. One is, are there any differences in the coding sequences of the PITX gene in the marine and lake stickleback fish? So they looked at the, they sequenced the genes of both the, uh, the marine and the lake stickleback, and they found that the, the 283 amino acids of the PITX protein are identical in the marine and lake stickleback populations. So the next thing they did was they attached uh, genetic markers to um, the genes, and they looked at the, uh, the development of those uh, different um, uh, of the different popul of the genes in the different population. So here they um, what they found was that the um, the PITX is expressed in the ventral spine and mouth regions of the developing marine stickleback fish, but only in the mouth region of the developing lake stickleback fish. So here the gene the gene is active. The, you can tell that the gene, it's this, the same gene that's producing uh, the mouth parts are active in both the uh, marine and the lake uh, stickleback fish, but only the spines are only produced in the marine fish. So this suggests that the gene is there, but that the, um, the expression of the gene is what's being altered. So the loss of reduction of ventral spines in lake populations of three spine stickleback fish appear to have resulted primarily from a change in the regulation of PITX1 gene expression and not from the gene sequence. Okay, so it's the gene expression that had the evolutionary effect here, not the, not the change in the DNA. Evolution is like tinkering. It's not goal-oriented. It's a process in which new forms arise by slight modification of existing forms. And remember when we talked about that, um, that previous uh, phylogeny where they had, uh, where they had um, how speciation and extinction affect diversity? And lineage A had many extinctions, and lineage B had few extinctions. Well, over time, lineage B might have more extinctions, and lineage A might radiate through adaptive radiation. So it's the, uh, those two. There's there's no telling what's going to be effective in the in the environment. It's all about those natural selection and environmental conditions. So evolution is like tinkering. It's a process in which new forms arise by the slight modification of existing forms. Most novel biological structures evolve in many stages from previously existing structures. Complex eyes have evolved from simple photosensitive cells independently many times. Exaptations are structures that evolved in one context but became co-opted for a different function. Okay, an exaptation, uh, for example, is like the wing of a penguin because it, it really functions as a paddle um, for the, for the um, penguin, but it was originally evolved as a, a wing in the bird lineage. So the bird lineage had the wing and then it, and it evolved into a function like a, like a fin or a paddle for the, for the um for the uh, penguin. That's an example of an exaptation. Natural selection can only improve a structure in the context of its current utility. Okay, now we'll take a look at some of the molluscan uh, uh, photosensitive uh, organs. Uh, we look at um, these organs from, from mo more, least, least, uh, least uh, advanced to most advanced. 
Okay, so these um, <clears throat> the least advanced organism is a is a limpet. They they're little shelled organisms that grow on the side of rocks. You may be familiar with them if you've done. Uh, I I'm not sure if they. I think we have limpets uh, on rocks in Virginia Beach, um, and uh, they're very primitive organisms. They just kind of crawl around on the rocks and they can just sense light or dark. Okay, they don't have a lot a lot highly developed vision. Um, Another uh, more adapted uh, species is the slit shell mollusk. It has what looks like an uh, an eye cup. It's a little bit more capable of developing uh, some directional sense of where the uh, di uh, differences in light may be coming from. Um, then there's the nautilus, which has a uh, pinhole camera type eye, which may be give it some definition of shapes. And then there's the marine snail, um, which is an eye with a primitive lens. Um, it, it's more capable of uh, discerning different shapes. And then finally, there's the, um, the squid. The squid eye is uh, almost as complex as our own eye. It's got a retina, a lens, and a cornea. Um, it's capable of discerning uh, different shapes and colors. Uh, it's really highly... Uh, at, uh, uh, adapted, but it, this is what we look at the the evolution of the eye over the molluscan clade. So uh, all these different mollusks, they have these different uh, adaptations, and we can speculate that over time, through evolutionary change, they evolved into these more complex organs, um, and those more complex organs then became well, the present day. Uh, like the eye of the squid, the most advanced trait of the, all those molluscan species. So the squid eye, it's like the it's like the uh, vertebrate eye, but it evolved in, in entirely independently. The squid Laligo has a complex eye with features: cornea, lens, and retina, similar to those of vertebrate eyes. However, the squid eye evolved independently from vertebrate eyes. Evolutionary trends. Okay. When extracting a single evolutionary progression from the fossil record can be misleading. Apparent trends should be examined in a broader context. The species selection model suggests that differential speciation suggests success may determine evolutionary trends. Evolutionary trends do not imply an intrinsic drive toward a particular phenotype. So evolution is not what's best or most beautiful or um, you know any other interpretation that you might inter have as a human being. It's what survives. It's what exists and persists in the environment. Okay, so um, here's an example of that. This, uh, this graph shows... Um, the, uh, here's the existing horse, um, Equus, uh, that is um, found all over the world now, uh, thanks mostly to human interaction. Um, the horse is not the, uh, it's not, it's, there's no like direct lineage to the horse. There's all these other different lineages throughout time that survived and, and some were, went extinct and oh, there's different period of time, um, only the equus survived, but it's not that it was, uh, you know, it's just the one that was best adapted to its environment. Using yellow to trace a sequence of fossil horses that are in intermediate in form between the present day horse and its Eocene ancestor, Hyracotherium, that's the one down here at the bottom, creates the illusion of a progressive trend toward larger size and reduced number of toes and teeth modified for grazing. In fact, Equus is the only surviving twig of an evolutionary bush with many divergent trends. So there's all these different types of 
of horses that um, horse ancestors that existed at different periods of time. Some were tall, some were short, some grazed, some browsed. Say, um, and it's just uh, basically through chance that um, Equus survived the grazing horse that we know today. Okay, let me see if I can explain this. This is a this is a graph from uh, this is a graph from your uh, scientific skills exercise on page four forty three. Uh, researchers studied the fossil record to investigate whether differing modes of dispersal could explain differences in the longevity of species with one taxon of marine snails, the family Volutidae. Some volute snails had platonic, platonic, planktonic larvae that could disperse over great distances on ocean currents. Other volute snails had non-planktonic larvae, which developed directly into adults without swimming stage. The dispersal of snails and the non-planktonic larvae was limited by the distance that they can crawl as adults. Okay, so um, basically there was greater diversity in the non-planktonic uh, species. Um, I recommend that you uh, go through this exercise and uh, draw your own conclusions. Okay, here are um, different... Uh, or this is herbivory as a trait that um, evolved from um, carnivorous uh, species. Uh, herbivory plant eating has evolved repeatedly in insects, typically from meat eating or detritus feeding ancestors. Detritus is dead organic matter. Moths and butterflies, for example, eat plants, whereas their sister group, the insect group with they are mostly closely related, the caddisflies feed on animals, fungi, and detritus. The, as illustrated in the phylogenetic tree below, the combined moth and butterfly and caddisfly group shares a common ancestor with flies and fleas. Like caddisflies, flies and fleas are thought to have evolved from ancestors that did not eat plants. There are 140,000 species of moths and butterflies and 7,000 species of caddisflies. State a hypothesis about the, the impact of herbivory on adaptive radiations in insects. How could this hypothesis be tested? Okay, what I would say is that um, there was, at the time that the moths and butterflies evolved, there was a greater, um, a greater variety of plants available for consumption. So it was probably the increased amount of, uh, or diversity of plant species that led to the increased uh, herbivory by moss and, and butterflies. So uh, the, one, the, the group of plants that evolved most recently in the greatest diversity is the angiosperm. So I would say that moth and butterfly diversity is linked to angiosperm diversity.